Hello friends, I want to personally welcome you to the LifeWorks Podcast. Before we begin the next episode, I want to tell you a true story. Something that happened to some very close friends of ours and that make this particular episode extraordinarily relevant right now. The, it's a couple, the husband was actually um, out biking and he was hit at high speed by a young distracted driver. He was so badly injured that he had to be medevaced to a hospital that specializes in trauma injuries. And he broke nearly every bone in his body. He had cerebral hemorrhaging. He had bleeding, internal bleeding, all kinds of things happening. And in that, to be honest, it was actually a miracle that he survived. In that moment, it left his wife with a considerable task ahead of her to figure out how to recover and how to how to figure out all of the administrative support that would be needed financially and otherwise insurance lawyers uh, all the administrative information when something catastrophic happens it reveals something it reveals how ready we are or not for significant life events the upcoming episode that I had with Mary Beth Simone talks specifically and directly to our readiness for major life events, whether they be catastrophic accidents, trauma, catastrophic illness, or even death. A lot of times we don't like to think about death, but we have to be pragmatic and we have to think, especially if 2020, nothing, if 2020 taught us nothing else, we need to think about readiness and preparation and we need to think very practically about the mortality of our lives. We, we as a nation and as a world have faced death on a global scale. And so it's something that we really do need to think about. So as you watch this episode, I hope you'll keep, <laughs> keep your own mortality in mind. Uh, keep my friend in your prayers, certainly. Um, but, but also take to heart the message of, of the episode. Really think about how to become more prepared for significant life events. If you're young and you're healthy, you don't always think that could happen to me, but that person is my age and, and it really hit close to home uh, how ready we need to be. So enjoy this episode of the LifeWorks podcast and thank you for watching. and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Mary Beth Simone. Mary Beth, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me on your show, Mark. Caring.com recently did a study in 2021, and they found that two thirds of American adults do not have any kind of estate planning. They don't have will. They don't have any kind of contingency plan in place. Why do you think people don't prepare or they don't have any kind of contingency plan in place? I think one of the reasons that they don't have their estate plan or their contingency plan in place is because it's not easy. And we like things to be simple and easy and to be able to do them quickly. It can be expensive working with an attorney finding, creating a relationship with an attorney. Some people have an aversion to working with attorneys. They want to do things online and all of those. And because there's so many questions to be answered, it can stall progress. Do you find that people just simply don't plan ahead? They're just trying to live in the moment and, and they're just living for today or let alone plan for end of life? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that happen. Like, one, I think that some people think that if they make a plan for end of life or for when things get difficult, that will jinx them or tempt fate, that kind of thing. Another one is that I see with some clients, the longer that they have a history of being healthy, really successful, the more 
emboldened they feel that nothing bad will ever happen, which is a very interesting dynamic when you see that with somebody who is 65, right? You're like, they don't have a will, they have a multi-million dollar business and, and they've been really healthy. What's the price that a person will pay for them not having any kind of contingency plan or estate plan or anything like that in place? What's the price of them not doing it? There can be tangible financial consequences to that for not having your estate plan in place and your estate needing to be probated. On the intangible side, things may not flow to the people that you want them to flow to, or that you had mentally assumed they would flow to. That doesn't always work out that way. And the other thing is that it creates confusion, stress, and anxiety for the people who are there to help you. So it might not even be an end of life situation, but I see it all the time with people, even young families, someone gets sick and their friends and family want to help and nothing's written down. There's nothing that somebody can just hand to them and say, here, would you take care of paying the bills for a little while so that I can be with my spouse in the hospital and just focus on my kids and that kind of thing. What's the benefit of people putting some kind of contingency plan in place? There are so many benefits. One is that after clients put a contingency plan in place, somehow it frees them mentally to achieve new heights, which this is just fascinating to me. I love to hear this from my clients. So for business owners, I've seen people who always intended to transition the business to their adult children after they put the contingency plan in place and they start having those crucial conversations with their adult children. And it just, it opens up the lines of communication. And then they say, oh, okay, I think it's time to start that transition. I'm going to move into my retirement passion project and start transitioning the business to the kids because they're adults now, they can handle it. They understand the business. And with Young families, I see them get serious about financial planning, getting the right insurance policies, like life insurance that's not connected with their work, which is a great approach to take, which many people don't think about. All of those kinds of positive outcomes. Is there any kind of correlation between those who do have a plan and their level of measurable success, wealth or company position, net worth, those kind of things? I would say. From a net worth perspective, it runs the gamut. And the people who are most interested in creating their contingency plan, which I find this fascinating as well, tend to be between like 35 and 65, which I'm so curious about the younger set of people who are interested in that. And more than a net worth, Identifier, I would say that it is people who have seen things happen. They either have a past where they're very firmly rooted in the reality of life, or they have as an adult or even as a younger person have witnessed someone else navigating, maybe a parent navigating after one of their siblings passed away or a grandparent passed away, something like that. And they know the struggle. What do all of those folks who do have plans in place, what do they all have in common? They all accept their mortality. And I would say that they are highly empathetic for the people who will be left behind. So they just, they care so much about the experience after they're gone or when they are incapacitated short-term or long-term for some reason. Now, as part of your business, you created something called the AWARE Contingency Planning Framework. What does AWARE stand for? Talk us through how it works. I created this framework to try and be something that would be memorable for people that they could just carry with them mentally. The first A stands for accept your mortality. 
that's really the cornerstone of creating your contingency plan. We have to accept that something may go wrong, will go wrong eventually. The W stands for who do you trust? And that is identifying who do you trust to be your second in command or your most trusted person who you're going to share all of this information with. The second A is assemble important documents. Now you'll often see this in publications about preparing for the unexpected, get your important documents together. That's what takes up the bulk of time in creating your contingency plan. It's just one short little bullet, but that's very important. And then R is review annually with your second in command. And then E is create an easy password system. So it needs to be easy for you to use and it needs to be easy for your second in command to use, which sometimes means that it might be two different password systems. You also created another framework, but for business continuity called COPE. What does COPE stand for? And again, talk us through how that works. For the business continuance playbook, we use the COPE framework. And so we begin by creating a list of owner roles and responsibilities. So we think of what are those tasks that only the owner takes care of, maybe at a 30, 60, 90 day interval, maybe quarterly, annually. So we think of things like paying sales tax, identifying the healthcare for the employees, those kinds of things. Then O stands for owner operating procedure documentation. So I commonly find that business owners have documented the procedures for their employees to follow or any of their contractors to follow, but they never document the procedures for the things that they do. I know that as a business owner and with working with business owners. So that's the next step. And then P is for assembling the procedures into the playbook. And so the playbook is going to include the procedures the decisions, and all of the owner responsibilities. And then E is to evaluate the playbook with key personnel. And there we want to take feedback. If anything is unclear, make some updates, and then we keep that updated. So this playbook is really geared towards empowering the key personnel to be able to step in and cover the owner responsibilities if the owner is unable to do so for a period of time. Thank you for talking us through those yeah. two frameworks. They're really helpful. Just speaking for myself personally, I would want to start with myself at home. Run us through the checklist of what people need to do for themselves personally first. I agree with what you're saying your approach would be is to start with your personal life. And that's what I recommend to anyone who I work with, we start by creating the contingency plan for their personal life, and then we move on to creating it for their business. This is where that bullet of assemble your important documents blows up. (laughs) So that includes your information about your bank accounts, your beneficiaries, your birth certificates, cable, internet, card photos. So that's making photos front and back of every card that you carry in your wallet. Collections. So inventorying any appraisals that you have for collectibles in your home, credit card information, divorce decree, final arrangements, if you have any preferences in that area, health insurance, investments, life insurance, long-term care insurance, living health care directive, marriage certificate, medical history, phone and mobile, power of attorney, real estate, rental properties, RMD, social media, social security, utilities, vehicles, Wow. (laughs) I can see why it takes people a long time. It's trying to prepare for taxes or or, or something worse than that. (laughs) That's exactly. And that's why I tell my clients that when I encourage them to update their plan when they're doing their taxes, because we're pulling all that type of information and we're in that paperwork mayhem anyway. So it's perfect timing. Do you recommend using digital or physical media for this type of compilation? That is an excellent question. And the way that I work with my clients is we create a physical contingency plan. So it's a binder, everything goes in the binder. So the 
deed to your home, the titles to your vehicles, your birth certificates, everything goes in that binder. Now, there is a company out of New York City called Everplans, and they have a cloud for contingency planning, which, and they are an excellent company. And I believe that their cloud security is vetted very well. So that's the key with putting this type of personally identifiable information in the cloud. I don't, you don't want to put it in Dropbox. You don't want to put it on your iCloud, that kind of thing. So Everplans has a cloud service for this. And a lot of financial planners offer Everplans to their clients for free. But what I have heard from different financial planners independently is that clients don't use the free service. Mm -hmm. And the reason they don't use it is that there's no one to coach them through the process to help them gather the documents to keep them on point with right. going through the process. So I would say that people could use my system, gather all of the information, and then once they have it together in the plan, then they're ready to start scanning it and uploading it into the cloud. Having a cloud service sounds so much easier, but it doesn't negate the need to pull all of this information together. Sure. And I can understand people's concern that putting basically your entire life in the cloud, I would have some reservations about that myself, just given the level of the hacks that have taken place all over. You can name them Equifax, Yahoo, Evernote. A lot of them, the, these hacks have compromised so much personal information. So I can I could understand why people would have some reticence about using that. But I see your point clearly about using physical media as well, if, if we decide to do digital. Some people say, oh, that's nerve wracking to have all of my important documents in one place. Somebody could just walk off with my plan. So there is nothing that is 100% secure. So we have to consider the risks and see what suits us best. But I also recommend that people store their plan in a fireproof safe. So it's a matter of making sure that it's where it needs to be. For example, I've had mine out for a couple of weeks because I need to make updates and I haven't done the updates yet. So that's not smart. It's important for it to be in the right place. But then we also think of when I work with clients, they're taking all of this important information out of their filing cabinets and putting it in the plan. How safe was it in the filing cabinet? What do you think are the largest obstacles for people starting to put this plan together? There's a couple of things. When I work with people, we work in in a four week process. And I ask clients to commit to allocating 12 hours, including the time that they work with me in that four week time period. So having time available to do that and committing to a project, a four week project is an obstacle. Other people, they may divide and conquer when it comes to the financial information. So it may not just be one financial manager, it may be a joint effort and getting two people together to work on this project may be a little more challenging. What are the largest obstacles that people face when they're trying to finish their plan? It's important for people to keep momentum. And that is where working with a coach is invaluable. So having deadlines, having accountability and learning a process that will get you to the finish line. If you're left to your own devices, chances are you won't complete it. And that's why I don't sell the plan outright without the coaching, because I find that people don't complete it. So one of the things that you talk about is your password book. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I created a password book for myself and for my clients because I use an online password manager, but that does not work for my second in command, who is my husband. And so I had a bound password book that I got from Amazon and quickly exceeded the capacity of the A's because we are Amazon, American Airlines, Apple people, right? 
then I was sticking pieces of paper into the book and it was just messy. So I created my own password book, which is in a three ring binder so that it's flexible. You can move the pages around. You have the right number of pages in the book. And then I discovered these erasable pens, which are pilot friction pens, which I give to all of my clients. And I recommend to people to buy because this way you can erase your security questions, your passwords, and keep the book pretty neat and clean and up to date and easy to read. So you mentioned your husband is your second in command. How do you determine who the best person is to be your second in command? What qualities should we look for in that second in command person? That's a great question. And this is something that I spend time with my clients trying to figure out who would be the best second in command for them. So number one, the person needs to be trustworthy. You need to be able to trust them with access to your passwords, everything in your financial life. So if they don't meet that requirement, then they shouldn't even go on the list of people to consider. The second thing is that they need to accept your mortality. So the reason that you're going to ask them to be your second in command is you need them to step in for you when something goes wrong or if you pass away. So if they fall apart, when you start talking about that kind of concept, then they are not a good candidate to be your second in command. The third thing is they need to be talented at doing difficult things. So we wanna think about the person who can navigate an emotionally charged situation and still take care of business, which that is usually a particular personality type, a particular type of person. And it needs to be someone who is adept at handling paperwork, which is not for everyone, but there are a lot of processes, maybe talking with corporations and all that kind of stuff and handling paperwork. Do you have any examples of anyone that you've worked with who was a second in command and actually had to step in and use someone else's plan? That is a great question. I do have a business owner whose adult daughter is the second in command and is also pretty integrated in the business. It was eye-opening for her to see everything. Like she thought that she knew a lot. And then when we put the contingency plan together, it was like, oh, there was so much more. And then with her coming into the contingency planning process, I think she was able to influence the business owner to simplify Mm -hmm. um, some of the financial landscape. Some of the things were a little overly complicated. So she was able to influence the person, her parent to simplify, which was really in her best interest because she is the second in command. I did have a client too, who has two homes and created the contingency plan and has a home in Pennsylvania, a home in New Jersey. The primary home is Pennsylvania, was at the home in New Jersey, left his wallet, drove to Pennsylvania, didn't realize that he didn't have his wallet till he got to Pennsylvania and then realized, oh, I have my contingency plan here in Pennsylvania with photos of all of my cards. So he needed to go to the bank and which he got to the bank. They didn't need to see the physical cards, but he did have that as a backup and sent me a message saying, Oh, I'm so glad I have my contingency plan in place because I can't believe I just did this. What kind of resources do you offer to help people do this? Before people work with me, I offer monthly webinars so that anyone can connect with me and learn the framework and have an opportunity to ask their questions, their personalized questions. And I also have a free contingency plan kit on my website that helps people get started. So it has a medical history form, which I suggest everyone use that. It makes it so much easier going to the doctor's office. And it's great for your second in command because that's information that we really never share with anyone about our medications or history, all that kind of stuff. It has a 12 question checklist that helps people think through things that they need to take care of. And it has instructions on how to create the password book that I give to my clients and the forms for inside the password book. What are the first 
three steps that people need to take? First, I would say get your estate planning documents in place. So that means your will, your power of attorney, and your living will or healthcare directive. And if you do already have them in place, then take them out and read them. So it's not a set it and forget it kind of thing with estate planning documents. You want to review them annually, make sure that nothing has changed. Usually within a five-year time frame, there's something that needs to be updated. And when you go to your attorney to make those updates, sometimes it's free or it may be a very minimal charge. So it's nothing to worry about from an expense perspective. So number one is to get your estate planning documents in place. Number two is brainstorming a list of who can be your second in command. For some people, it's not that simple to figure out who that will be. So use those techniques that I discussed earlier, make a list, and then start to narrow that down and have the conversations with the people and see if they're willing to do that. Because it is a commitment, uh, a time investment, and when the time comes, It's a serious commitment. And then the third thing is to create an easy password system. It might mean two password systems, depending on who your second in command is, make sure that it works for them as well. Very good. Thank you. This has been so helpful for me. And I know it'll be helpful for at least two thirds of America right now (laughs) (laughs) that don't have any kind of contingency plan in place. And and you do this and you help people to do this really helpful insights that you've just shared. So thank you for that. So I want to do something a little bit fun, uh, a little bit different, and it's called speed round. And so I'm going to say a word and you tell me the first word that comes to mind. And if you want to elaborate a little bit on something because it strikes a chord, you're absolutely welcome to do that. Okay. Netflix. Savior. COVID-19. Inevitable. Why would you say that? I feel like there were so many scientists who were predicting something like this. And even our government had been prepared for a pandemic for years and years before that office was dismantled. And so many smart people knew that it was going to happen eventually. Legacy feeling. I think a legacy is more about the feeling that you leave than what some people might think about the money that you leave. And I think it's important to, for us to consider how will people feel when we're gone. And that's why I think a contingency plan is important to help lessen the stress. Pfizer. Trusted. Bitcoin. Risky. Why would you say that? (laughs) I guess because after so many years in financial services, I worked for a very conservative company, Vanguard, and Bitcoin just seems so out there, even though I know that the value of it is incredible. But yeah, it's hard to understand, hard to follow, and not something most people can ever invest in. Apple. Addictive. Tesla. Clean. CDC. Undermined. Really? I feel like it's unfortunate what happened over the last couple of years, the way that their authority had been undermined and the politicization of the work that they do. And I hope that they're able to rebuild. Anthony Fauci. Respected. Donald Trump. Shame. Shame. Why would you say that? I feel like in so many ways, the experience during his presidency brought feelings of shame for me as an American for some of the things that happened with the open demonstrations of white supremacy from Charlottesville to the insurrection. I would say that it just, from beginning to end, left me with a feeling of shame. Joe Biden character character now fun fact uh you and i both come from the philadelphia area so we know joe biden he was like our third senator (laughs) that's right (laughs) yeah that's That's right actually one of my closest friends met him at a delaware football game and has a picture with him yeah and he was always a very local kind of guy he took the train back and forth and 
he was very just very known in our in in that area in fact absolutely he even taught, i believe he taught law or history or at widener university for a time oh did he i didn't realize that he mm -hmm. taught as well mm -hmm. he did he did yeah yeah wall street record setting just the way that the stock market has reached levels that i never expected that it would reach and it continues to do so elon musk 164 billion dollars that's just like who is worth 164 billion dollars it's astro it's astronomical pun intended <laughs> there's so many things i could say about elon musk but that's all another innovator steve jobs yeah technology I, I just feel like he just completely transformed the landscape of technology and created all of these huge fans and followers who are addicted to the technology success i would say transformation i hmm. think that our personal success is really measured in the way that we can bring change in our own lives and in the lives of others. Great answer. Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea. Unpredictable. Indeed. Amazon. Easy. Disney. NBA. I just think of how they like saved the NBA through the pandemic. <laughs> and finally, Mary Beth Simone. Innovative. Tell me more. So this business that I started is something that no one else does. And when I talked about doing it, people would look at me sideways, like you can't do that. that's not done. And it's, let's see how it goes. And so far so good. And I encourage anyone who has those innovative tendencies to please bring your ideas to light. Fantastic. So I want to ask you just a few general advice, lessons learned questions. If you could share one secret of your success, what would it be? For me, I have embraced the struggles that I've experienced throughout life from childhood through adulthood and tried to find meaning in those challenges and having that mindset and perspective, it allows me to be inspired by what I learn through that struggle. What is the greatest lesson you've learned either in life or in business? That's a great question. So I would say the greatest lesson is that none of us are guaranteed time to make our dreams come to life. So it's important to do what we can to be methodical and take care of the business that needs to be taken care of, whether it's from a financial perspective, investing, that kind of thing, but to never lose track of what that dream is and to do everything that we can to make that see the light of day. If you could offer one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? Treat people fairly. I don't think that there's any escaping the karma that comes from not treating people fairly. And it may take a long time to see it come to fruition, but it comes. Yeah, I'm a firm believer in karma myself. <laughs> yeah. What do you want most for your life? I think for my life, I really want to be a force for positive change in my own community. And I want to be able to bring some type of positive outcomes to people who are just doing the normal day-to-day -day life with their family or running a small business. So I've asked you a lot of questions. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would like to share, or do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with us? So one thing I don't think that I talked to you about is that I have worked on creating a TED talk this year. And so I am in the process of looking for a TEDx stage to be on. And then that will eventually be the foundation of a book that I plan to write next year. So I'll tell you more as that evolves. Fantastic. Mary Beth, this has been so incredibly helpful. Where can people find and connect with you online? I'm most active on LinkedIn. So 
I would be happy to connect with anyone, any of your listeners. So just let me know that you heard me on the LifeWorks podcast, and I would love to connect with you. And my website is nichepartnershipconsulting.net. And if you'd like the free contingency plan kit, just go to nichepartnershipconsulting.net slash kit, and you can download that. Then we'll be connected on my list. Couldn't get easier than that. (laughs) Mary Beth, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic interview. Thank you for everything that you shared. Thank you for spending the time with me today. Thank you so much, Mark. This has been an honor to be on your show. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, click the subscribe button to get the latest content and check out these other great clips from the podcast.